Five of the common reaction types are listed here. What I'd like to do is go through each one individually with an example, look at particle diagram representations of each, to get a better understanding of each one, and also to emphasize the difference between when things are charged and when things are neutral, and how to use that to determine subscripts and coefficients and all the other features that people struggle with in writing out chemical reactions. So in our very first one here, we're looking at a synthesis reaction. We're looking at magnesium reacting with oxygen to make magnesium oxide. So our equation is written up above the skeleton equation. Uh, as, as we start this, the first thing we could do is we could go ahead and balance it by saying that we need two of these so that we have two oxygens on both sides, and then two of these so that we have two magnesiums on both sides. So with that balance, let's go ahead and do a particle representation where we start with two magnesium atoms. an O2 molecule, and talk about what we end up with. We end up with two magnesium oxides. So in magnesium oxide, we're going to see a salt crystal kind of structure. And there's a couple ways that we could draw this. So I'm going to start like this, but we'll talk about the difference between this and reality in a little bit. So what we're doing here is we're starting with two magnesium atoms, one oxygen molecule, and we're ending with two magnesium oxides. Now in reality, a magnesium oxide compound is going to be a solid, oxygen is going to be a gas, and magnesium is going to be a solid. So alternatively, we could go ahead and we could draw this where the magnesiums are in the solid form, the oxygen is that atomic form of the gas, and the magnesium oxide we could draw perhaps a little more like this. Okay. And then if we were to expand this, we would find that as we added more of each of these different components of this, that we would find that magnesium in the solid form maybe looks like this, where we have a whole bunch of magnesium particles, whereas the oxygen gas looks maybe more like this, where we have a whole bunch of oxygen molecules flying around. In the magnesium oxide, we would see something to this effect like this. So it's tough to start with a simple particulate representation because we, we, you know, zooming in on a solid might look similarly to zooming in on a diatomic gas. They're actually quite different. Uh, these would be far more spaced apart, even than what we've drawn up here. These would be in the solid form, but they're not too linked together. It's a grouping of a whole bunch of magnesium atoms, and not in a particular ratio of any kind. In the magnesium oxide, likewise, we would have a one-to-one -one ratio, but not necessarily a specific arrangement. Or, and also not in the molecular form, Matt, where we're looking at a one of these with one of those. Rather, we're looking at a grouping where there's one of these for every one of those. So when we look at the particular representation, we now want to go through and ask ourselves, okay, well, what do we do with charge on these? So when we have a metallic sample where we have just a pure element, so over here we're looking at magnesium solid. So whenever you have something that's by itself, that thing has to be neutral. So this is a neutral element. Right, so the same amount of positive and negative charges are embedded in that anytime you have something elemental. The oxygen molecule, likewise, is also neutral. And in this particular case, with nonmetals, each thing that's embedded in this is, is neutral. So we have two neutral atoms combined to make a neutral molecule. However, magnesium oxide is a neutral compound. With charged ions composing that compound. So in this particular case, when we look at the, what do we have? The magnesium is in blue, so we have the oxygen here. So this is not O, this is O2 minus. And all of these are O2 minuses. And these are not Mg's. Rather, these are Mg2 pluses. And so in this case, we do have charged species, and that's why we have to have this magnesium to oxygen in a one-to-one -one ratio. So all of these in here are ions, and what's important about that is a lot of people don't understand that when they go to write this, they try taking this too and applying it over here. They try um, kind of having a consistency with the subscripts, and that doesn't work for this because in the ionic compound, our formula and our subscripts are going to be based upon the charges. So we're looking at a case where we have a 2 plus and a 2 minus charge, and therefore we have 1 to 1 ratio of those particular ions in the compound. So when you have an ionic compound, when you have a metal, non-metal, when you have a cation and anion relationship, then you're going to be doing charge, charges to do that. And that gets tricky when you go to elements where that's not the case. 
So we're going to go through and look at some more reaction types, and we want to always distinguish whether these species are charged or not charged or neutral. So the second reaction type we're looking at is decomposition. Here we're starting with one thing and we're ending with two different things, in this case a compound and an element. So again, we can start by balancing. So let's go ahead and do something simple here. So two of these react to make two of these and three of those. And as far as states of matter go, normally when we're doing a decomposition, we would consider the salt to be in the solid form. This one actually does melt when you heat it, so we could do solid or liquid. So we'll go ahead and go with liquid. The potassium chloride that results from this is a solid, and the oxygen produces a gas. So from there, if we're actually gonna do a particle diagram representation of this, we're gonna take potassium chlorate, A, CO3, and we're going to need two of them. So KCl O3. Oh, actually, I have a K plus a little closer there. And then we're forming two KCLs and three O2s. Okay, now in our particle representation here, we've ignored spacing to a degree. So if we go back, this is in the liquid state, so the potassium and chlorate ions would be kind of moving around, but still pretty much in contact with one another. The spacing of them would be very close. In KCl, we're looking at a solid ionic compound, so these would again be very close to one another. And then in the oxygen, we have a gas, so these, these diatomic molecules would be spaced very far apart. So we haven't drawn that because we're just drawing a couple of these. And if we go back, this is a good example of what are these numbers here, what do these coefficients represent? So the 2, the 2, and the 3 here represent that we have two of these formula units, two of these formula units, and three of these molecules. So let's go back now and look at charge in this regard. So here we're looking at an ionic compound. We have a cation and anion. And so this has a positive charge to it. And then this whole group of four particles there has a negative charge to it. This is a positive charge to it. This has a negative charge to it. And so our formula then is one grouping of this with one potassium ion. And so we see that works out. And then over here we have potassium and chloride. And again, we have a plus one ion and a minus one ion. So this is K plus and Cl minus. So this is a neutral compound, just like the chloride was, but it's comprised of charged ions. So our subscripts, even the one to one here, come from that charge balancing. Now here we have an element so that's going to be neutral, and it's comprised of neutral atoms. So the oxygen atoms here are neutral, and then the total molecule itself is neutral. Okay, so now we're going to move to single replacement reactions. So a single replacement, we're looking at an element and a compound. So we're going to go ahead and start by balancing this. So let's go ahead and use blue here. So we're going to have two of these and two of these, one of these and one of these. And this is a really good one for looking at charge analysis on. So let's go ahead and draw a particle diagram here. So we start with a single copper atom. And we start with two silver nitrates. And then we're forming two silvers and a copper nitrate. And let's see, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. So in this case, this is really interesting because if we look over here, we have a neutral element. But over here, we have an ionic compound, and so this is charged. This has a two plus charge to it. And so this copper and this copper are not actually the same kind of pieces, so to speak. This is a charged thing with a two plus charge. And then this one over here is neutral. So actually, in this particular case, we're looking at a copper that's going from being copper metal to being into the two plus charge state. So what's happening in this particular reaction is that that copper is losing electrons, and that's causing it to change what its charge is. Now if we look at the silver on the other hand, the silver is starting off in the charge state, starting off as a plus one charge. So we're starting off with silver plus ions, 
and those are turning into neutral silver atoms. And so if we look at how do we go from having a positive charge to a neutral charge, well, we're adding an electron. So if we look at the electrons here, what we're seeing is that the silver requires one electron to turn from its ion to, to metallic form, and then the copper loses two electrons to go from the metallic to the charged form. And so when we balance that, we had to have two silver ions react for every one copper metal ion. We had to have two of this kind of whole set of things here for every one of these, and that's where our balancing came from. So this is a really interesting reaction because this can be very confusing combining with the previous, previous types because here we're seeing a case where charge changes and we're looking at things go from being in the neutral state to a charged state. And so when we use charge to do our balancing it can be very tricky. So in this case, our nitrate has a minus one charge. So when we have a positively one charged cation for the silver and a negative one charge for the nitrate ion, we have a one to one ratio. But over here, we have a two plus charge for the copper and a minus one charge for the nitrate, so therefore we need to do a subscript here. So a lot of people will be confused on why do I have one of these here and yet two of them here, and it's because of the charges on these. Now copper does form a plus one compound as well, that is a possibility. So we could have done another reaction, but the two plus charge is a little more common in this particular reaction, depending on the exact concentration. Uh, so this is probably the more likely of the two. Okay, and our final one here, we're looking at, I'm sorry, not our final one, our fourth one here, we're looking at a double replacement reaction. So here in the double replacement reaction, we're going to start by balancing, we're going to put two of these. Now double replacement, we are to assume that these take place in solution. So, so barium chloride, we're going to assume, is dissolved in water, and therefore that's going to be aqueous. The sodium sulfate is dissolved in water. And generally speaking, your reactants are going to start off in the dissolved phase. It's very rare that you would start with a solid and then add an aqueous to it. It is possible. But most of these involve me mixing two solutions together. From there, we look at sodium chloride, which is soluble in water, so that's going to stay in the aqueous state. And the barium sulfate here is insoluble in water, so that's going to form a precipitate or a solid, something that doesn't dissolve in water. Okay, so here's our balanced reaction. So let's draw this a couple ways. Let's start with just a simple, straightforward particle diagram. So we have a barium chloride reacting with a sodium sulfate. And we are forming from that a barium sulfate. Like this. And then two sodium chlorides. Let's go ahead and put those together into you know, one set like that. So this is our reaction as we've written it like this. Now keep in mind now we're going to go back and now we're going to say this whole thing is taking place in water, in solution. So we're going to start with, we have two beakers to start. So we're going to mix them into one giant beaker at the end. So we're starting with barium ions, two chloride ions dissolved into a solution. So, so these barium and chloride ions are dissolved in the water in here. And then we're starting with sodium sulfate. So we got our two sodium ions and then our sulfates are going to remain in one clump. The polyatomic ions have covalent bonds that keep them together. And we put them together, and what happens is, is that the barium and the sulfate form a solid compound. So these are going to form a precipitate. And it's going to kind of clump and settle to the bottom, whereas our sodium chloride ions are going to remain dissolved in solution. So if we look, what we're seeing happening is we're starting with an aqueous solution where we have barium and chloride ions. The barium ions have two plus charge, the chloride ions have minus one charge. Then we have also another aqueous solution that we're mixing with it where we have positively charged sodium ions and we have two minus charge for the entire sulfate, not just the oxygens here, but rather this SO4 carries a two minus charge. And then we form a salt, an ionic compound where we have these two pieces together, and then the sodium and the chloride are going to be dissolved into the water. And so we're looking at the chloride and the sodium ions remaining dissolved throughout the entire process, 
whereas the barium ion here and the sulfate ions here come together and form this solid and precipitate. So that's kind of our reaction that's happening. And if you ever get into net ionics, that's what that's going to describe. So we could rewrite this reaction where just the barium and sulfate react, and the sodium and the chloride really don't change from their initial states to their final states because they just stay dissolved in the water the whole time. Okay, so for our final one here, we're looking at a combustion reaction. So we're starting with methane and oxygen, and we'll go ahead and form CO2 and water. So when you're balancing a combustion reaction, you want to start by balancing all of the non oxygen features first. So carbon was already balanced. We're going to balance the hydrogen first. That gives us four oxygens on the right. So we'll have two added two on the left there. So we have four on each side. For states of matter, methane is going to be a gas. Oxygen, of course, is a gas. Carbon dioxide is a gas. And then the steam formed will generally start in the gaseous state and then maybe cool to the liquid later. So if we go ahead with particle diagram representations here, here we're looking at CH4. Now this is different than a lot of the ionic compounds. This is a molecular compound. So we're not looking at a charge balance state for this particular substance. And then the oxygen, we have two O2 molecules. And we're forming a CO2 molecule from that. And two H2Os. So we're starting with this, we are rearranging things to form these. There's not charge balancing taking place on this, so we're not looking at a case of like a four minus and four plus, uh, four minus, or four plus and a two minus thing. We're not doing that. We're actually looking at neutral compounds. Um, and so, so for that, we don't really have the subscript constraints that we normally do. And so in this case, we're always gonna form CO2 as long as we have sufficient oxygen. We're always gonna form steam as one of our products. We're going to form O2 of the diatomic reacting with whatever our carbohydrogen compound is, or hydrocarbon carbon. Hydrocarbon compound is. So for this, it's a little more straightforward because we're not actually working with, we're actually kind of working in a more ambiguous state, so therefore you kind of have to be instructed on it as to exactly what, what you're expected to do. Okay. Now, so a couple points that come up as this is we're just starting into this, so in the future, some more things are going to come up. So just to kind of give you a heads up on these. These reactions have many more particles. We saw that in the first uh, set of particle diagrams, but really we're doing you know, two of these and one of these, when in reality it might be two gajillion of these with one gajillion of these that are doing the reactions. So these balanced reactions are recipes. They're not actually descriptions of like one of these mixes with two of these. They could be, but it's really unlikely to just have a singular reaction in that particular style. The second point is that a lot of times we draw these where we're like, oh, we start with these and we end with these. But these reactions don't just happen where things start to break apart and move apart. In order for that to happen, there has to be some kind of contact necessary to begin the reaction and facilitate these changes. So really, when I'm drawing four molecules over here and two over here, what I'm implying is that those are going to hit together as they move throughout space and the, and the collisions are going to cause these rearrangements to occur. Okay. Uh, later on, you might get into the fact that some of these reactions could happen backwards, so we can form the products, or we could take the products and form them back into reactants, and we could set up an equilibrium between the forward and backwards reactions. And then there are other reaction types besides these. So we've shown you five, but really there are many, many others, especially if we get into organic chemistry. And then as we get to some of those other ones, you're going to find that actually if we look at a deeper level, some of these five are actually similar reaction types. So there's similarities between combustion and single replacement and synthesis and decomposition that maybe are different, um, that maybe you wouldn't have anticipated by looking at whether things are elements or compounds and how many of each thing you start with. But if we look at a deeper level electronically, we'll find that. And we'll actually find links to some of these other new reactions like complexation and redox reactions and, and uh, synthesis and um, what do you call it? substitution reactions, elimination, you're going to find a lot of commonality between what's going on electronically.